Hello, hello! This video goes over the Algebra 1 Unit 2 Functions Test Review. So first question, plot the following points. So I'm going to plot 0, negative 4, which means I'm just going to go down 4 units on my y-axis. This is my x, there is my y. So I'm going to go down 4 units, 1, 2, 3, 4. There is my first point. Negative 3, 2, I'm going to move to the left 3 units and up 2. Negative 5, negative 1, I'm going to move to the left 5 units, down 1 unit. 5, 0, I'm going to move to the right 5 units, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I'm not moving up or down at all since that y value is a 0. And then 2, 5, I'm going to move to the right 2 and then up. 5 units. So here are all of my points. Letter A, is this a function? So if I look at my graph, I can see that it is a function because it passes the vertical line test. I do not have any of those points stacked on top of each other to where it would intersect the same line multiple times. So you can see with all of these vertical lines, well, some of these are not drawn very well. Oh, you get the idea. All of these vertical lines are only crossing through the point one time. I can also look at my points and see that this is going to be a function because each one of these x's has its own y value. So each input has one output. So is this a function? Yes, it sure is because each input has only one output. Or you could also say it passes the vertical line test on the graph. Part B, is this relation linear or nonlinear? So if I look at the five points that I plotted, I need to ask myself, do those five points form a straight line? Well, they don't form a straight line at all. So that makes this nonlinear. So nonlinear because the points do not, do not form a straight line. There we go. All right, let's go to number two. Number two, draw an example of each type of graph. So an absolute value graph looks like the letter V. So I'm just gonna draw a V-shaped graph. A cubic function it looks like someone doing the disco where I start at my origin right here. And I am going to go up to the right and down to the left. Quadratic is a U-shaped graph. A linear function is a straight line. Square root looks like a sideways curve. And exponential looks like a backwards curvy L. All right, number three. State whether each of the following would be continuous data or discrete data, justify your answer. So as you can see, I did write down some notes about discrete versus continuous. Discrete, you can actually count, and continuous can be anything. So if I look at my examples, the number of students in an algebra class throughout the semester, this would be discrete because I can actually count the number of students in the classroom. The weight of a puppy for the first six months, that would be continuous because this puppy could have, you know, fractions or decimals as part of their weight. So, for example, the puppy could weigh 12.5 pounds. Um, it's not something that we can actually count. It is something that we can measure. The number of televisions in each household, that is going to be discrete because, once again, we can count the number of TVs in the house. Number four, the domain of f of x equals one fourth x plus six is negative one, zero, two, and four. What is the range in set notation? 
So in order to find the range, I am going to take every single one of these values in the domain and I'm going to plug it in for x because once again, domain represents your x values. So I'm taking all of these values that I have in my domain and I am just going to plug it in. So I plugged in negative 1, I plugged in 0, I'm going to plug in 2, whoops, going to plug in 2, these should be plus 6's, and I am going to plug in 4. Now if fractions have a tendency to freak you out, you are more than welcome to use a calculator, but I'm going to go ahead and run through this. So negative one-fourth times negative one is positive one-fourth, or 0.25 if you're a bigger fan of decimals. So I have 0.25 plus 6 is 6.25. Negative one-fourth times zero is zero. Zero plus 6 is 6. Sorry about my dog. Hang on one second. Okay, I got my dog to start to stop barking. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> negative one fourth times two is going to be negative one half or negative 0.5 plus six, which gives me 5.5. And again, you can use a calculator if you want to. Negative one fourth times four is going to give me negative one plus six, which is a positive five. Now, as I write my range, in set notation, I'm going to go ahead and write it in numerical order. So my lowest number was 5, followed by 5.5, 6, and 6.25. All right, number 5. Observe the pattern below to answer the following question. So figure 1 has four boxes in the middle. And then I have two boxes on each side. Figure two has the four boxes in the middle. Figure three also has the four boxes in the middle. And I have my two boxes on each side for figure two and three boxes on each side for figure three. So if I look, my yellow that I highlighted stays consistent throughout all three figures, but it's my pink boxes that are increasing. And what's happening is I am adding one box on each side. So how do I see the pattern growing? I am adding essentially two boxes. So I'm adding two boxes to the pattern. So it's one on each side. Okay, how many squares would be in figure 12? So if this continues, hopefully you'll notice that the number of boxes on each side corresponds to the figure number. So figure one has one box over here and one box over here. Figure two has two boxes on the left, two boxes on the right. Figure three has three boxes on the left, three boxes on the right. And of course you have the four boxes that are right in the middle. So that means figure 12 is gonna have 12 boxes on the right, 12 boxes on the left, plus the original four in the middle. So that gives us 24 plus four or 28 squares. How many squares are in figure 2000? So once again, you're going to have 2,000 on the left, 2,000 on the right, plus the 4 in the middle. So that gives us 4,004. Now, write a general rule for this pattern. So let's say I'm using the letter N to represent the figure number. I did N plus N plus the original 4. So I have my figure number on the left, figure number on the right. Those are what we're adding, plus the four in the middle. So I can go ahead and combine my like terms, and that gives me 2n plus four as my general function rule for the pattern. 
Number six, the Matia cross country team is selling neon shirts for $15. The money from their shirt sale goes directly into the cross country savings account, which already has $200 in the account. The team has 150 neon shirts to sell. Create a function rule, letting S represent the number of shirts sold and M of S represents the total money the team has in the savings account. So I'm gonna go ahead and start by writing my M of S. They already have $200 in the account and they are going to get $15 for every shirt that they sell. So I'm gonna do 15 S. And that is the function that represents the total amount of money in the savings account. What is a reasonable domain for this situation? So it does say that they have 150 shirts to sell. So that means the amount of shirts that they have to actually sell is in between zero and 150 inclusive. So they could sell zero shirts. They could also sell 150 shirts. So that's exactly what my explanation is going to be. So my domain is going to be, let's see, zero to 150. So the number of shirts is between zero and 150. Um, your inequality, you can also write in interval notation as well. So my inequality and in interval notation would be brackets because I have the or equal to and that would be zero to 150. Now, what is the reasonable range? Now, in order to figure out the range, what you are going to do is you are going to plug in the values that you had for your domain. So I am going to plug in zero and 150 into my function, and that's going to give me my values for the range. So when I plug in zero, that gives me 200, I'm gonna go ahead and write it down. 200 plus 15 times zero is zero. And I'm also gonna plug in 150. So 200 plus 15 times 150. Let me grab my calculator for a second. So 200 plus 15 times 150 gives me 2,450. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write my inequality now. So my inequality is going to be 0 is less than or equal to m is less than or equal to 2,450. And if we wanted to write this in interval notation, that would be 0 to 2,450. Now for our explanation, we want to talk about the units, so the amount of money. in the account is between zero dollars and two thousand four hundred and fifty dollars inclusive meaning that there could be zero dollars or there could also be at two thousand four hundred and fifty dollars Number seven, is each relation a function? Yes or no, explain why or why not. So if I look at my mapping, this negative eight, which happens to be your domain or your inputs or X, this negative eight is going to two Y's. It is going to negative six and one. So this is not a function. because that input has two outputs. For letter B, I'm gonna use the vertical line test since I have a graph, and if you'll notice, each one of my vertical lines is crossing through my graph in just one spot. So yes, this is a function. Because it passes the vertical line test. And letter C, I'm going to look at my X's and I want to see if any of those X's are being repeated because that means it would have multiple outputs. In this case, each one of my X's are unique. So I have four, one, five, and seven. 
So this is a function. So yes, it is a function. All right, number eight. For a car traveling at a constant rate of 60 miles per hour, the distance traveled is modeled is model d of t equals 60 t, where d of t is the distance traveled and t is the time in hours. You are going to travel at most 10 hours. Create a table of values and graph for the situation. So we want to travel at most 10 hours, and the least amount that we can travel is for zero hours. So I'm going to do zero through 10, but I'm not going to do every single number because that's a lot to plug in. So I'm just going to do 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, and I'm going to plug all of those in for t. So 60 times 0 is 0, 60 times 2 is 120, 60 times 4 is 240, 60 times 6 is 360, 60 times 8 is 480, and 60 times 10 is 600. Now I'm going to take all of those and graph them. So on my x-axis, this is going to represent the time in hours. And my y-axis is going to represent the distance. And that is in miles. And my distance ranges from 0 to 600. So I'm going to go ahead and do every tick mark representing 100, but I don't want to label all of them just because I don't want to run out of space. There we go. Okay, so at zero, the distance is zero, so I'm going to plot that. At two, the distance was 120, so it's about right here. At four, the distance is 240. At six, the distance is 360, it's about right here. At eight, I have 480. And finally, at 10, I have 600. Now, before I connect the dots, I do want to see if I can actually connect the dots. Because when I connect the dots, what that means is, is that I could have the times all in between these values. So between 0 and 1, 1 and 2. So every single one of these values would actually work for the time, which it does. Because you could travel for two and a half hours, you could travel for 5.75 hours. Oh, I did not mean to erase that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and connect all of these dots. And actually, what I'm explaining right now is the difference between discrete versus continuous. So this right here is a continuous function because you can actually travel for fractions of an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and answer that since I just talked about it. So it is continuous because I'm going to say it is continuous because you can travel for fractions of an hour. So anything that can be represented by a decimal of a fraction is, is going to be continuous. Okay, what is the domain? So the domain is going to be between 0 and 10, because that is our time. I'm going to go ahead and write the inequality. I can also write the interval notation. But it does say explain using the context of the problem. So the time traveled is between 0 and 10 hours. And then the range, so my range, which was the distance, that was between 0 and 600, or in interval notation, 
with our brackets because we have the or equal to. And the range, so the distance traveled is between zero and 600 miles. And we already talked about continuous versus is discrete. All right, let's keep going. For number nine, the cost of gas was monitored over the last six months. The graph shows the average price of gas versus the time. Determine the appropriate domain and range as an inequality for the situation by interpreting the graph provided. So when we're looking at a graph, your domain is going to represent um, what's happening horizontally. So what's furthest to the left and what is furthest to the right. So my time in months ranges from zero to six. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that as an inequality. I'm gonna use uh, T for time. We could also write that as an interval from zero to six. So my explanation is the time is between and this is all inclusive because we have the or equal to's, um, but the time is between zero and six months. Since that's what the graph tells us, it's the time in months. Now for the range, I want to see how low my graph goes, so the lowest points, and how high my graph goes. So my range talks about what's happening vertically. So vertically, my lowest was $3.50. Um, I'm going to use P for price, and the highest was $4. And again, I can write this in interval notation if I wanted to, $3.50 to $4. So the explanation is the price of gas is between zero, oh, not zero, what am I doing, is between $3.50 and $4. And once again, this is inclusive since we could have it equal $3.50 as well as equaling $4. Okay, now the rest of your review is all about practicing evaluating functions. So if I look at letter A, I want to do f of 2. So here is the f function. f of 2 is negative 2x squared minus 4x. So wherever I see an x, I'm going to replace it with my input, which was a 2. So I have negative 2 times 2 squared minus 4 times 2. And I'm just going to evaluate. You can plug it into the calculator if you want to. I'm going to go step by step. Order of operations tells me I need to do the exponent first. So 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8, so I have minus 8. Um, I'm going to multiply negative 2 and 4. That gives me negative 8 minus 8, which is negative 16. For f of negative 5, I'm going to do the same thing. So negative 2 times negative 5 squared minus 4 times negative 5. So I'm going to do the square first. So negative 5 squared is a positive 25. And then over here, I have negative 4 times negative 5. That gives me a positive 20. So I have negative 2 times 25 is negative 50. Plus 20 is going to give us negative 30. Now, if I look at letter C, I don't actually have an input. What I do have is the output. So what that means is, is I'm going to take my g function, 4x minus 5, and I'm going to set that equal to 19, since that was my output, and I'm going to use that to solve for my input. So I'm going to start by adding 5 to both sides. 19 plus 5 is 24. Divide both sides by 4. And I get x equals 6. All right, let's do some more. Um, for number 11, the first question says f of 2. So here's my f function. 
Now, another way to look at this is having a negative 1 in front of your x squared. So every time I write the problem, I'm going to put a negative 1 there so that it separates my x from the negative. And since my input was a 2, I am replacing all of my x's with a 2. Once again, order of operations tells me to do the exponent first. So I have negative 1 times 4 plus 4 plus 7. That gives me negative 4 plus 4 plus 7. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0. Plus 7 is 7. Going to do the same thing for f of negative 3. So negative 1 times negative 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3 plus 7. Order of operations says to do the exponent first. So that gives me negative 3 squared is 9. Positive 2 times negative 3 is going to give me a negative 6 plus 7. Negative 1 times 9 is negative 9 minus 6 plus 7. Negative 9 minus 6 is negative 15 plus 7, which is, oh gosh, what is that? Oh no, mental math skills. Negative 8. Well, now I don't trust myself, so now I need to grab my calculator. Negative 15 plus 7 is negative 8. Cool. All right, plugging in 7. So negative 1 times 7 squared plus 2 times 7 plus 7. 7 squared is 49. 2 times 7 is 14. Negative 1 times 49 is negative 49 plus 14 plus 7. That gives me negative 35 plus 7, which is negative 28. All right. Awesome. And like I said, you can use a calculator if you really want to. You don't necessarily have to do every single little step like I am. Okay, last set of problems. I have g of 2, so I'm going to take 2 and plug it in for x. So I have 2 times 2 squared minus 5 times 2 minus 1. Same deal as before, exponent first. So 2 squared is 4, 5 times 2 is 10. That gives me 8 minus 10 minus 1, which is negative 2 minus 1, which is negative 3. g of negative 3. 2 times negative 3 squared minus 5 times negative 3 minus 1. Negative 3 squared is a positive 9. Uh, negative 5 times negative 3 is a positive 15 minus 1. That gives me 18 plus 15 minus 1. 18 plus 15 is 33. Minus 1 is 32. And g of 7. 2 times 7 squared minus 5 times 7 minus 1. 7 squared is 49. 5 times 7 is 35, so negative 35 minus 1. 2 times 49 is 98 minus 35 minus 1. Where did my 1 go? There we go. 98 minus 35 is 63 minus 1 gives me 62. And again, I don't trust my mental math skills, so I'm going to test it out. Uh, 98 minus 35 minus 1 is 62. Okay, cool. All right, absolute value. So I'm going to take my x and replace it with negative 3. So I have absolute value of negative 3 minus 5. I'm always going to simplify what's inside my absolute value first. That gives me negative 8. And what absolute value does is it takes any negative values and it makes it positive. So that becomes a positive 8. Now I'm going to plug in 12. So absolute value of 12 minus 5. Let's see, 12 minus 5 is 7. So I have absolute value of 7. And 7 is already positive. So absolute value of 7 is 7. All right. Plugging in 3. So absolute value of 3 minus 5. 
uh, gives me absolute value of negative 2, because again, I'm simplifying what's on the inside. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. All right, that was a long review. So hopefully this video helps you get prepared for your upcoming test. Good luck on your test.